I'm Desiree Timms. I'm the Judiciary Program Director at League of Conservation Voters. We are absolutely thrilled to be hosting this panel today to have this much needed and very important conversation, um, especially right before um, important elections. And we know that we have work to do, um, not just during presidential elections and presidential cycles, but state and local as well. And so the panel today is uh, full of black magic and exciting and exhilarating leaders and champions and advocates who will provide some great insight. Um, so I'll be asking them some questions, um, hopefully some that you all wanna hear. And then um, if I didn't ask something that you wanted to get asked, you'll have that opportunity uh, towards the end of the panel. So with that being said, let's move um, towards introductions. I would like to say a little bit about some of the work that the League of Conservation Voters um, has done. We have been working to expand some of our democracy work and focus more on voting across the country and states at the national level. The impact that a lot of voting has in our judicial work um, on environmental matters, um, environmental justice. And so we are just um, thrilled to be a part of the panel this year and to be supporting the uh, Congressional Black Caucus Foundation. That being said, I'd like to move forward and move over to Nicole. Um, we'll start with you and we'll work our way down the panel, um, one to two minutes, and then we'll circle back. Thank you, Desiree. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm so happy to see so many of you here, because I have to tell you, whenever I'm talking about voting, some people ask me, who's interested in voting? They need Ooh. to be in this room because uh, they clearly didn't get the message. I'm the director and counsel of the Washington office of the Brennan Center for Justice. We are a national legal advocacy and think tank organization affiliated with NYU School of Law, and we like to do what we call fix those broken parts of our systems of democracy and justice. And we all know that right now our system of voting is broken. And so there's a lot of work that we have to do. We use the tools of litigation, advocacy, and public policy research to do just that fix what is broken. We know that we are in an emerging period right now where we saw some disillusioned voters. We see systems breaking down. Machines are not working as they should across the country in different electoral precincts. We also see there's been foreign interference in our, election, in our elections by an outside nation. So this is a moment of crisis. But what we do in a moment of crisis is we use that opportunity to try and make sure that we put ourselves in a better position than we've ever been in before. And so that's what I'm hoping we will talk about today, Desiree, is how we make our voting systems work better. And also how we start speaking truth about what's going on with respect to our voting systems. We know that there is a commission right now that President Trump has formed uh, about voter fraud. Well, I have to tell you, based on the work that we've done on voter fraud at the Brennan Center, I have to tell you this, it's non-existent. And the thing about this commission is that even though it's basically a sham commission, and really what it's doing is making people feel that there is an issue where none exists, the good thing about it is that it is going to help those of us who are truth tellers be able to set the record straight. Because the more they talk about voting fraud, the more we can talk about the statistics and the numbers and the research and share the information that the fact is you can be struck by lightning more easily than you can encounter voter fraud. So it's okay for them to go ahead and have their discussions like they did in New Hampshire on September 12th because we will counter that with our discussions about what really is existing in the United States. And that is that we don't have a problem with voter fraud. We have a problem with not enough people actually engaging in the voting process. So that's what we really need to be talking about. We also need to be talking about how we improve our machines, how we make it easier for people to register to vote, and talk about reforms like automatic voter registration. That's what we do at the Brennan Center, and that's what I spend my time doing here in Washington, spending time with great leaders like Mr. Conyers, and thank you, Mr. Conyers, for holding this conversation, and working with him and others to ensure that we get the kinds of reforms that we need in Washington and, out and, and in the rest of the country. So I'm looking forward to the conversation today to talk about about those reforms and not talk about what's wrong, but talk about what we need to do to make things right. Do I have to go after you? That was 
Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Ashley Bryant. I um, have a bit of a unique background. I started my career actually in the private sector, and so marketing big brands, um, and then moving over into political and community engagement. And so now, I most recently, I'm trying to really be a connector between corporations that have the resources that can actually impact change in the communities that matter most, which are communities of color for, for myself. And so um, I am a public engagement strategist. I work with a number of clients in the nonprofit space, also some political candidates of thinking about how are we engaging voters, mostly also millennial and young voters, um, and how are we using the resources from a lot of these corporations that have the means but aren't actually using them in the best ways possible. Um, and so for me, one of my passion points of thinking about and a lot of things that uh, Nicole touched on, but as we talk about voter suppression and, and how are ways that we can use influencers, celebrities, big brands to actually talk about these things, but actually impact change in, in the ways that we're thinking about all types of political and engagement strategies. So I'm just excited to be here and add my two cents and, and listen to the power players on the, on the panel. Good morning. Good morning. So it's a pleasure to be here today. My name's Tanya Clayhouse. I am currently the principal and co-founder of Clayhouse Consulting, formerly the Deputy Assistant Secretary for the Department of Education. I know, what does that have to do with voting? Um, <laughs> but also formerly the Policy Director for the uh, Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Under Law and uh, People for the American Way and Chair of the Civil Rights Section of the National Bar Association. So my history and my background uh, has been kind of around uh, these issues of voting, around the issues of enfranchisement, of civic engagement, ensuring that um, our people are engaged in the entire process, the electoral process, because it is foundational to ensuring that our communities are able to succeed um, and do all that we should be able to do in American society. I want to take um, a point of privilege to defer, I guess, some of my time. I'm going to reclaim it in a second. but. Um, <laughs> But I want to uh, introduce the president of the National Bar Association, Juan Thomas. Um, and I want to thank you, uh, Congressman Conyers, for allowing us to participate on this panel today. Uh, president Thomas is the president of the Bar Association for this bar year. He has one of his focal points of voting rights and civic engagement. Um, I chair the legislative division uh, or committee as well at, with my partner in crime, uh, Michelle Jawando, as well as chair the civil rights law section. And it is something that we do and I have a passion for, as I said, um, but I see it as kind of a comprehensive approach. I see this as an opportunity to ensure that we're not only like as we're engaged in the civic process, that also means engaged on all levels. Uh, so you're talking about on the local, state, and national level. It's not just about getting to the ballot box on a presidential election. It's about getting to the ballot box when you're voting for your school board members, because that is also foundational for the success of our students and how we're going to ensure that they're achieving the society. You have to have the right people in place on the local, state, and national level. Uh, we also, I've been particularly engaged and I have a passion for ensuring that we're protecting that right to vote through a variety of mechanisms, including the Election Protection Coalition uh, that I was uh, happy to be able to uh, kind of help formulate <laughs> many years ago, I'm not going to say my age, um, as this has evolved throughout the years and it has uh, taken on a life of its own. And it is something I think many people are aware of vote this, uh, this issue of voter protection, uh, election protection. And so I'm really proud that we are able to continue to work across the board with all the people that I see here on this panel today. I look forward to uh, continuing this discussion today. And I do hope that we can also talk about how the lawyers uh, can continue to make sure that they're leading and helping to protect this fundamental right to vote. So thank you. Hello. Hello. Okay, so I am the child of an AME preacher, so you're going to have to talk back to me. Hello. Hello. All right, all right. Congressman, it is always an honor and privilege um, to, to be here. I remember being a CBC intern, um, being on the other side, and so always um, fortunate to be with you and your amazing team. So I like to start the conversation by saying this. 94% of black women Come knew on. the deal... 
and tried to warn y'all, okay? <laughs> so I'd like to just start there um, because as we think about voting rights, you know, I have spent my career, I'm vice president at the Center for American P Progress, which is a public policy think and action tank. I'm the co-host of a podcast um, called Thinking Cap and chair of the National Bar Association uh, with my sister here, Tanya, um, of a group of lawyers around the country trying to change. But what I start with is I have three little girls who now have to look at this president who every single day has an administration that is devoted to keeping them from the ballot box. Whether you're talking about the pence Kobach Commission, whether you're talking about an avowed racist John, by the name of Donald Trump, and then over at the Department of Justice, over, come on, I'm not by myself here. When we talk about this Attorney General and what he's done at the Department of Justice in less than six months to turn back progress that we have made. When I think about the fact that the Constitution, there is no greater right that is enshrined in the Constitution other than the right to vote. It is in the Constitution five different times. No other right appears that many times in our Constitution. And yet we have an administration that is committed to stopping most of the people in this room from gaining access to the ballot box. But the question is what we decide to do with that. I told you I started the conversation saying I'm a child of the black church and I often think about when we marshal our resources and we see our power and the possibilities that lie in our communities, there's very little that will ever stop us. But the problem is so many of us have forgotten our power. We've forgotten our ability to organize, to petition our government, to run for public office, to support legislators who are doing the right thing. And so they have decided, and you know it's a funny thing when you say they, you never quite know who they is, but they have decided that they are going to create whole campaigns based on our apathy. And we allow them to do so. And so on today with so many of my friends and my big brothers and my sisters and my colleagues, we are going to continue this conversation. But I pray that you recognize that you have a role to play here and we're just going to be standing right with you. Thank you so much. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Derek Johnson. I'm the inter interim president and CEO of the NAACP. Uh, originally from Detroit, Congressman, uh, but live in Jackson, Mississippi. Uh, one of the things that we must stop doing, in my opinion, is reacting to their narrative. Their narrative creates a deficit mindset. The commission that we talk about is nothing but a communication device to talk about a broken system that's not broken. We need to create a narrative talking about compulsory voting. 200 countries already do it, like Australia. We need to talk about eliminating voter registration, the very nature of citizens to fill out an application and apply to register is vote suppression. We need to talk about the removal of restrictive polling places. Why should someone get off work, drive past three, four polling precincts before they get to their precincts when the technology would allow us to vote at any precinct that's available and they readily identifiable and they don't change? And we need to talk about having voting on a Saturday or making it a holiday. Why should we be voting on a work day and it's quarantined within 12 hours of that day? Voting is about power. It's not a fair game. It's not set up to give access for those who they want to exploit for free and cheap labor. It is set up to control the tax system to determine who gets taxed, who's not taxed, and what the tax dollars are spent on. It's about money. Our currency is our vote. And so when we begin to enter these conversations, let's start talking about a proactive conversation and not a reactive based on someone that's narrative that was born in the Cato Institute or the Heritage Foundation so mm -hmm. we can think something is broken about a system that we can't control if we maximize it. Second big point. You look at presidential election turnouts, African Americans, we vote. When you look at off-year elections, in many cases, we don't vote at the same level. Black folks do vote. We don't vote when we most need to vote. 
So when I look at the state I live in, 63% of African Americans vote during the presidential election. 52% of white folks voted in the same state. We represent just under 35% of the voting age population, and yet we cast 40% of the ballots. How did that happen? That happened because there was infrastructure and machinery there to make it happen. What we have seen over the last 15 is the implosion and the depletion of the black political machinery that's not controlled by a political party. When you talk about DC voting patterns, you got to go beyond the city limits. We got to start talking about Montgomery County and Come Prince on. George County because that's the pattern of black migration. When you talk about Detroit, you got to go beyond the boundaries, although it's an 80% black city or Atlanta. We have failed in those two areas off the weight of our success. Black folks made a whole lot of money where they moved Southfield, Bloomfield Hills, <laughs> Farmington Hills. West Bloomfield. <laughs> That's the weight of our success, and as opposed to us building and replenishing our political base through developing our communities, we've moved out and left people abandoned. So how do we begin to have that conversation? That's the conversation we need to be having on these panels. This is a brain trust, not a trust to react to somebody else's game. We got to set a new game. And that new game needs to be rested in our ability to control our political machineries. The Harlem political machine, dead. Detroit political machine, dead. Atlanta's looking at their last black mayor, possibly. We're looking at perhaps the last black mayor here in DC. Oakland political machine, dead. Gary political machine, dead. You can go across the country. Alabama had one of the best political machines, dead. There's only about four black political machines left. That's the conversation we got to have when we're talking about voting and voting power, uh, patterns and understanding how to think through creatively new laws and not react to the old laws that's on the book that have not always been our best friend. All right. First and foremost, I'm always excited to be in the presence of one of my mentors uh, Congressman John Conyers. Um, uh, he was one of my, I had two amazing mentors. One was Dr. Dorothy Irene Height, um, and, the other, and the other one was Congressman Conyers, who took me in as a, when I was a White House intern at the, at the Clinton administration, little redhead guy, and he uh, let me, he worked with me back then. So it's always good to be in his presence. It's always good for me being president and CEO of the Hip Hop Caucus to be sitting next to the NAACP. Um, that to me is not only a, 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 an important piece, because we talk about intergenerational conversations, but we need to have intergenerational institutions as well, in which we can work together side by side. Hip Hop Caucus being 13 years old, and um, I don't like telling about his age, but NWCP is <laughs> looking good. Y'all the best hundred, yo. Look, y'all look good for that. I mean, y'all. I mean, you know, I got some Botox going on or something. Y'all looking all right. Um, so that's that's, and no issue has impacted the hip hop community. No right is more important than the right to vote. That is what I always tell. I'm also very excited. I'm wearing two hats today. I'm the President of the Hip Hop Caucus, but I'm also on the board of the League of Conservation Voters as well, LCV. But let me first say this, why I'm so excited about why this vote for us. The hip hop, hip hop has always been political from the days from the beginning of the Bronx. So we've always been political, had been being the CNN for our community. But when it became hip hop being, uh, having politics, I would say really took place around 2000. Um, for many of us, when we saw not just the hanging chads, but more importantly, when we saw the roadblocks to the FAMU students in Florida, that was one of the things that I think that really catapulted many of those who in hip hop at that time, um, from Russell Simmons, who I worked for at the time, which Hip Hop Some Action Network, um, Jay-Z and others, we then came together and said, what can we do? And at that time, we are just gonna get out to vote. And then we had these campaigns, we had the Vote or Die campaign, with P. Diddy, we had Voice Your Choice with Jay-Z, and we had Hip Hop Summits um, with Russell Simmons. And that's important because then after the 2004 election, 
you know, many of us, you know, were like, man, this didn't quite turn out how it was going to turn out. We were kind of new to this whole progressive movement thing as well, which was also new seeing, because when you're in hip hop, you're not around a lot of liberals as well, so you don't understand that dynamic, so we absolutely saw that piece. And then we then created the Hip Hop Caucus, actually. That's important because when we first created the first Hip Hop Caucus, September 11th, 2004, we actually wanted to have that Hip Hop Caucus here um, at the CBC. At that point in time, um, they wouldn't allow it because they said, hip hop, um, you know, we don't want y'all to be here in the hallways. So then we had the first hip hop caucus. There was, it, as, you know, I'm also a preacher, so it was, there was no room in the inn, I guess. Um, and so we had the first hip hop caucus, which was actually a blessing because sometimes you need to be close, but not sometimes not too close. And so we had the first hip hop caucus actually at Howard University. 900 young people showed up on September 11, 2004. I say that because one of the things from that aspect was that I'm also overjoyed because then one of the key issues for us working with folks like the Brennan Center um, and the Lawyers Committee and others was that we begin to develop things regarding felon disenfranchisement. We, we, we begin to get all this information. We said, wow, we have so many folks who are ex-felons and see that was the, the, the still some of the Jim Crow laws. And so I went to, at that time, looking when Barack Obama was running, we saw that there were still a lot of people who were, they were excited about President Obama, but there was a whole generation of young people who still didn't feel like a person of color who went to Harvard represented them. And so they, they, they wasn't connected. So we actually created a campaign back then called Respect My Vote. And I called T.I. as a matter of fact, because we also said we want to have a spokesperson who is an ex-felon. And so I called T.I. at the time, at the time he was under house arrest actually, um, and I said, T.I., I want you to be the spokesperson for this campaign. He was like, man, Rev, I can't even leave my house. I'm going to be your spokesperson. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, um, so I said, we, that says we're going to work that detail out. Um, we're we going to figure out how that's going to work. But so, so happened, and we worked with uh, some other counterparts from ACLU and other parts here from, you know, like Tanya Clayhouse, others who were there, other lawyers, and NWCP, legal, uh, LDF, and that process came and said, you know what, because T.I. is actually, he's in the system in Georgia, and he's actually, he's been um, convicted, but he's not actually incarcerated, and since his old crimes are off the books, technically, he can vote. And so when he heard that, he was so excited because like, dang, I didn't know. And that's one thing about this policy is an amazing thing. Those little small details mean so much. So T.I. got excited because he, he thought he couldn't vote because he, he was because he was going to prison, but he was in prison, so he could vote. I say this because today, later on this afternoon, so folks like T.I. and then this past year like Vic Mensa and Kiki Palmer and Amber Rose, all those folks are now coming to the CBC. They're now in the hallways. I'm running across folks like, you know, I'm just seeing folks. And so I'm telling you, this voting thing is the beginning inroads to this process. It is also the inroads for our community and generation to be a part of the democracy process. That's why they fight so hard to keep us from voting. That's why they put the roadblocks and the voter IDs and they try to put the laws in the books to keep young folks because when they get a taste of this thing called democracy and really understand what it can do for freedom, then there's something about that that then that revitalizes that this that this makes folks and I can so I can show you TI is one example on the other side of that my LCV hat is this which is on the side of climate change and climate justice um, I just read the report here almost in tears talking about with Michigan and Flint talking about how the water in Flint now they said that 12% of the birth rate has decreased um, literally genocide, literally, literally people now not having children. And so we see that. We saw that what was going on in Standing Rock. We see what's going on today. No electricity in Puerto Rico. They said it won't have power for a month. The hospital said the generators won't last more than two weeks. We have cancer babies. We have senior citizens. It is a crisis right now going on in the world. There's fire, fire, firestorms over there in California. There's still folks who can't live in Port Arthur because those toxins, those coal fire power plants that they put in our community that they're there, they're the ones that are overrunning now 
bleeding out and poisoning our people. This is a crisis moment. And so I'm so glad that LCV is here because we, as a progressive movement, must break down the silos in our movement. You can't have climate change here That's and right. voting rights here That's and right. LGBTQIA over here and human rights down here and immigration. At this moment, we need to pull off every label that has been applied to us. Tell the foundations, thank you, but now is the time for missing drift. Now is the time for us to come together and work together. Now is the time that we must unify ourselves in this process. This is our moment. This is our lunch counter moment for the 21st century. We have got to rise. We have got to stand up. This is our time. I don't have much to say now that um, <laughs> Reverend Yearwood has, has brought us to church. I guess I just say we like to open the doors of the church and pass the plate and take up a collection. <laughs> My name is Simone Sanders. Uh, I am a CNN political commentator. Thank y'all for watching. Uh, I am also a democratic strategist. Uh, and I particularly spend a lot of my time at Priorities USA. What is going on with these men? They too close. <laughs> I spend a lot of my time over at Priorities USA where I serve as their strategist for communications and political outreach and I work primarily on building our political partnerships um, specifically around engaging some of these new grassroots groups from the activist community to folks like Indivisible um, to people whom y'all probably have never heard of but are actively working in their communities, engaging those folks um, and giving them some infrastructure and you know a little money where it matters uh, to do the work. And I also work in our voting rights work. Um, and so Priorities USA Foundation is one of the largest funders of voting rights litigation in the country. Um, in, in 2017, in January, we merged um, Priorities USA Foundation with our Every Citizen Counts initiative. So currently, we will sue you. Um, and the lawyers <laughs> on the panel understand that uh, litigation is costly. But if you have a good team uh, and you can pay for the litigation, it works. And unfortunately, litigation is some of the only remedies that we have because we are not able to stop some of these detrimental voting rights laws that are on the books. So we have legislative monitoring teams in 15 different states. And uh, when we can't stop the legislation, we'll sue you. Uh, well, we will support someone to sue you. So we are currently supporting uh, the NAACP of Indiana. Um, we are supporting a lawsuit there. We're supporting a lawsuit in New Hampshire, uh, SB3, because since January of 2017, over 30 states have moved to introduce more than 90 pieces of legislation to curb the right to vote. Since January of 2017, over 30 states have introduced over 90 pieces of legislation to curb the right to vote. It affects every single person in this room, whether you're a young person, a seasoned person, a person of color, a woman. It, basically, if you are not a straight white man, they are coming for you. And so um, I know we're going to talk about engaging activism and how do we move beyond the ballot box. And I think it's one thing to galvanize people and tell them to you know, get out to vote. And, that's, and, and we are absolutely, I've been involved in a number of those efforts doing that work. But I think it's a whole other thing to support this activism that is happening in our communities all across the country. These young activists that have literally lit fires um, from, from Ferguson to Flint to Oakland, to Baltimore, to right here in Washington, D.C. Those are some of the young folks, the people I think we need to pull into this conversation. I look forward to talking about that. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Yep. Um, I'm a member of the Polish parliament. And uh, Having lived in Poland for 36 years, I've been using the language, the Polish language. So it has made my English to be unpolished. <laughs> uh, so please bear with me if at all you might not understand what I'm trying to say, but uh, of course I'll try by all means. <clears throat> Let me first of all thank the organizers of the Transatlantic Political Leadership Conference. Uh, it's my first time to be here with you. And on behalf of the Polish Parliament, I would like to share our sympathy to the victims of the Hurricane Irma in Florida. 
It is indeed a human disaster that will be remembered for ages. I have been an elected member of the Polish Parliament, I mean, I'm an elected member of different lo local and national bodies for the last 15 years now in Poland, a country which is predominantly white. Uh, you can hardly meet a, a dark colored person in uh, some cities, not to mention my constituency where out of 800,000 inhabitants, probably 20 voters are black. And uh, we could say that, uh, uh, that, that, that in that 20, we could include my son and my daughter. <laughs> 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 right. Nevertheless, I success, successfully actually contested in five elections. It has been, uh, it was only in 20, uh, 2006, I was a shadow regional representative just for a year. This is my second term of office in the Polish parliament that consists of 460 representatives and one black representative. And that's me. And uh, guess what? I am actually the only one that has been a parliamentarian for the last two years, but we were two in the previous term of office. Um, the, since, 19, since 2015, I have been a delegate to the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe. For those of you that might not know, this is a body consisting of 47 countries of Europe, 28 European Union can, member countries, and uh, 19 non-European non Union member countries, including Russia and Turkey. I'm one of the 18 parliamentary, parliamentary representatives from Poland in this body, and since 2015, the only person of African descent in the group of slightly less than 800 members of parliament. Currently, I'm a, report, a rapporteur of two important reports, at least important in my opinion. I do not know the opinion of the others, one of the reports is uh, on addressing humanitarian needs of internally displaced persons in Europe, and the other is to promote diversity and equality in politics. And that's why I'm honored to be in this panel, actually to talk about voting and the voting rights in uh, Europe as well. Uh, the report is actually underway there are a lot of uh, results that have come out, and I I'm, I'm here to present it to the Assembly in April 2018. A questionnaire was sent to all member countries, 47 member countries, and 32 of them actually replied to that questionnaire. I would like to point out that Poland is a young democracy. Uh, we have had elections since 1989. We vote on Sundays. <laughs> so there is actually one thing that probably the U.S. with the oldest democracy can learn from Poland is the fact that we vote on Sundays. That's a non-working day. But otherwise, all the other things we are learning actually from the U.S. and other countries to be able to make sure that our democracy is running smoothly. So I really thank you for having invited me to this conference and uh, look forward to a very effective and actually fruitful discussion today. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning to everybody. Uh, let me say Sunday is a work day for some of us. And, so, let me, and let me also say that after you go to church, we want you to go vote. Um, after you leave your tithes and your offerings. Let me say first of all, let me say first of all, uh, I'm Wendell Anthony, pastor of Fellowship Chapel in the city of Detroit and also president of Detroit, uh, branch of the NAACP, which is the... Which is the it happens to be the largest unit of the NACP in the country, and I'm, I'm very pleased to be here with uh, the interim newly 
installed president of the NAACP, Derek, attorney Derek uh, Johnson, who's doing an outstanding job, and with all the colleagues who are here. And let me say uh, initially, I cannot go anywhere and be a part of anything uh, that the leader, uh, the dean, I said Dean, capital D-E-A-N, the Dean of the United States House of Representatives, our own John Conyers, Jr. We must, we must recognize, we must recognize uh, Congressman Conyers because he's an icon. Uh, he's a part of our history and our current reality and our destiny. I just left the Museum of African American History on the mall. So you know I'm already fired up just going down and being a part of that. And thanks to John and others, the history that you see over there is a part of the history that he has helped to make. And now we find ourselves at this point, uh, Sheriff Napoleon from um, Wayne County and former Executive Director Joanne Watson and many who are here, uh, the board members, uh, we find ourselves at a peculiar moment. Um, I, I like what Reverend Yearwood said when he talked about the holistic approach to what we're talking about, because you cannot connect the dot to voting and not connect the dots uh, to climate change, to the repression that we see with police departments, to all the other things right. that are going on in this nation. They are connected. Right. Years ago, uh, a woman by the name of Sojourner Truth, whom you've heard of, was speaking at a rally in upstate New York. And as she was speaking, it was a women's suffragette rally, and she was talking about human rights and voting. There was an older white gentleman in the rear that said, oh, woman, what you are speaking about means about as much to me as a flea buzzing around the rear end of an elephant. And Sojourner Truth looked at him and said, sir, you might not like my buzzing, but I'm guaranteed to keep you scratching. We must continue to keep our nation scratching. It is, in fact, 52 years since the anniversary of the Voting Rights Act. It is, in fact, four years since we had the gutting uh, of the same act. We need to understand, as been pointed out, since the recent elections, there have been 99 bills introduced in states around the country, involved in 31 states, rather, involving voter suppression and frustration. Out of that, one third of those bills have moved out of committee and are on the floor of state legislators, legislators right now. It is important to also understand that for many of us congressmen, we feel as though we are in another reconstruction. You might understand and remember from history in the election of 1876, in the Rutherford B. Hayes and Samuel Tilden election, that there was a compromise, a deal that was made in 1877, which would mean that we would pull the federal troops out, that we would disempower black folk who have gotten voting power, that we would undercut businesses, that we would do all those things that would snatch power back from those people who have in fact earned it and fought for it and bled for it. When you go to the museum, you see folk who have fought for it and died for it and bled for it. When you look at 2017, you see people who have fought for it and died for it and who have bled for it. And so now we see with Jeff Sessions pulling back on voting registration and voting enforcement policies and police consent decrees. We see the bogus committee called the Integrity Committee, which has no integrity, composed of folk like Chris Cobalt, composed of folk like Ken Blackwell, Hans von Spassky, and a number of individuals who in fact have a record of voter suppression. The fact that we need to be very clear, y'all, let's be clear. What we're seeing today is a white lash to Barack Obama being elected as president of the United States of America. And no, I didn't say I didn't say black lash or black lash, it's a white lash to folk who do not believe that that was legitimate and now let's snatch back everything that we seem to have gained. Right now, healthcare, which is not a black healthcare program or a brown healthcare program or a white, it's an American healthcare program for everybody that needs healthcare. Let's snatch it back. The same people 
who are snatching away and putting up barriers to voting, barriers to police involvement in communities and the oversight of that. The same people who are doing that are suppressing the right to vote. So what do we do? We need to make sure, congressmen, and to our senators, that we engage in heavy oversight. We must have oversight of various committees. We must have oversight of the Justice Department. Jeff Session almost looks like he's gleeful every time he gets ready to make an announcement when he's getting ready to diss somebody. I would say something, but so many ladies in the house, so I really can't say. But it has to do with biology and when you get happy, but I won't say, I won't say nothing about that. But I'm really saying, what I'm really saying is this. As we look at these priorities, Congressman, as we look at that, we need to involve in same-day voter registration and mobilization. We need to involve ourselves in guaranteeing that no last-minute voting changes will adversely affect the voters. We need to, in fact, urge the House and the Senate to endorse and support H.R. 2978 and S-1419, that is Strengthening the Voting Rights Act and the Voting Advancement Act. We need to push that legislation. We need, we are winning elections in our states, but the way the districts are drawn, the way the congressional districts have been laid out, we are being gerrymandered and therefore our votes are not getting the full impact. They have racked, stacked, and packed the voting districts so that no matter what happens, these cats are guaranteed to win the elections. We got to fight that. That's why in Michigan we have a ballot initiative that's going to be on the ballot next year with enough signatures to allow the people to decide what the boundaries should be and not the politicians because we understand that they have a different analysis. We need to engage ourselves in the use of social media. It must become a major priority. There, the older, mature community is on Facebook, book, but the millennials and the young folk are on Twitter, on. Face, uh, Snapchat, Instagram, <laughs> and all other stuff. We need to be texting your vote. We need to be on Facebook, take a look at your vote. On Snapchat, voting in just a snap. On Twitter, your vote is but a tweet away. And Instagram, and Instagram, in Instagram, you can instantly change your own future. We need to increase funds for updating equipment and training, increase programs for automatic online voting. We need to eliminate the barriers for returning citizens and ex-offenders to participate in the voting process and increase participation. We need to declare a national holiday for national elections, providing more time for voter participation. We need to increase the time allotted to participate in early and absentee voting. There must be a renewed effort implemented within our educational system to teach the benefits and responsibilities of participating in the American democratic process. The structure of government and the responsibility to participate in the electoral process should be taught beginning in elementary through high school. Right. The emphasis must not be placed on political party or ideology, but on responsibility and civic duty. When our students graduate, when they walk across the stage, they should be given their diploma in one hand and their voting registration card in the other hand. We need we need to make sure, Congressman, that we tell everybody to take your souls to the polls and vote because your life, your freedom, your democracy depends upon it. Pastor Play. Well, <laughs> that was quite the introduction. If you haven't been to Black Church, I just introduced you to every denomination. <laughs> We are going to move forward with the questions. We're going to keep them, the answers brief. <laughs> he, he touched on uh, one of the questions. One of the first questions I was going to ask is about the millennial voters um, and the way millennials receive information and the way that they're getting engaged. We're seeing the power in social media, the power in Facebook living events, interactions with police. Any intimidation efforts are being recorded. 
That being said, we still haven't found the silver bullet to mobilize young people. Mm -hmm. Is technology the answer to turn out woes, or what are some of the best strategies to engage this dynamic generation? Simone? As the resident millennial on the panel. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I guess I want to push back a little bit. I think we have found really great strategies and, and ways to mobilize millennial voters. Like, Millennials and black women elected Barack Obama in 2008 and in 2012. Um, and I think the, the problem is, folks don't understand that 45% of millennials identify, at least 45% of millennials identify as independents. That means they don't have any party loyalty, they don't care if you got a D or R or I or G behind your name. Millennials, we would like to talk about the issues. And I think one of the best ways we can mobilize the millennial generation, the millennial contingent, is to speak authentically and specifically to issues that um, millennials are dealing with in places and spaces where millennials are. And when I'm talking about millennials, I'm not talking about college students. I'm 27 years old, I'm a millennial, I'm not a college student. Millennials own businesses, we have homes, we have families. Um, there are dynamic places and spaces that we are that candidates, campaigns, issue stuff, issue activism, they're not coming to us. And so one, it's where are we engaging? Two is how are we engaging? Um, I don't have cable. And a, a, a growing number of millennials get, are telling you that they get their news from Twitter and Facebook. That's dangerous because if you know anything about the Facebook model, you know Facebook is designed to only show you things that you like and not what you don't like. And so that creates those silos that Reverend Yearwood was talking about. But I think the, the key to quote unquote mobilizing the millennial generation is actually drilling down and talking about the issues um, and then thinking about our activism and our mobilization differently. Like, it's not just black college tours and churches, even though I, I'm here for the churches and the black college tours. But where are some other places we can go, do, and be? And what are some other issues? We, the census, the 2020 census is a civil rights issue we're not talking about. We talk about engaging beyond the ballot box. We don't got to go vote for the census. It's happening. We need to participate. And so how can we move communities and young people um, to understand that one, the census is something we should be talking about, but we should be engaging on and around right now. So I'm not a millennial. But <laughs> I, but I am. I no, no, I work with an office full of millennials who tell me that man, Rev, they take that health care away. What you gonna do? <laughs> Some of the old folks might get that one. Y'all might not have got that one on the cuff. When you work with young folks, they tell me all the time, they say season. But in that process, for me, I will actually give you some good news, actually, about what we are doing. The Grammys actually will take me moving from L.A. to New York for the first time. I have been getting, we have been, first of all, very much like Simone says, we are not about Republican or about Democrat but we are definitely about humanity. And I think that's important from the standpoint of the issues. Now, there are certain folks who are good on those issues, and I think that's important for them to understand that component. But one thing that we are doing with our campaign right now, I have been approached by so many, and we will be having the largest hip hop voting campaign ever. I mean, I have, you know, normally we get approached by artists like, you know, who are here today, like from Vic Mensa and G Herbo, and Chance, um, you know, Kiki Palmer, Dreezy, um, you know, so many folks from Detroit, like Trick Trick and others, and, and, and this around. But some of y'all from Detroit know what I'm talking about. But all of them have been calling because they want an audacious goal. And so folks like from Beyonce and Jay and others are saying, this year, Rev, what's the big goal? And I said, what you mean, what's the big goal? Like, what number of folks do we need to register? And I said, well, maybe we could do, um, do 10,000. That's not big enough. And I said, what's, what's the number? I said, well, the Hip Hop Caucus, over the past 13 years, has registered hundreds of thousands. And they said, well, great. So I asked all young folks who want to be a part of this Respect My Vote movement, the goal that's been given to me by many artists is that let's register a million people in 2018. Let's go for it. 
That sounds let's, like a let's, great let's plan. Let's register a million people. So please, if you're with that and you're a young person, go to respectmyvote.com, respectmyvote.com, and let's begin. We need a lot of work to do that. But let's let's make that go happen. Let's let's make 2018 be that midterm election when young people bust out the ballot box. That sounds great. And as a young person, as a millennial, I'm excited to to help you with that. Um, I would like to take to take a moment to um, recognize and honor Congressman Bobby Scott, who's joined us. In the <laughs> So moving forward on this uh, tone and topic of young people, what would you say to the young people who didn't vote in 2016 or who have friends who didn't vote or friends who voted third party? Um, do you view it as disrespectful to some of the pioneers who have died for our right to vote? Do you see it as peaceful protesting? Do you see it as ignorance? What, what is your perspective? Open to the panel. Can I jump in here first? Because no, I, <laughs> I actually, if I continue talking to them after they've told me that, um, because I think for me, I view it as, as a large disrespect. Um, and I know that there's a lot of you know, influencers and folks out there that have a large platform that have been very vocal about not voting, but you know, putting a lot of time and thought into their resources. But I think for a message to, to young folks, and I'm a millennial, I guess I'm a little older millennial, but like, I don't understand if you know anything about history and what has gotten us here, because taking a step back in this moment is what's most important. And I think when we're talking about the research, if you're looking at polls and surveys, the importance of actually knowing how did we get here today? What has brought us here in this moment? And if you understand that, then how are you not going to make your voice heard? And there's no greater way than actually applying that with your vote at the ballot. And that's pretty much every conversation I've ever had with anyone who has said, you know, I wasn't vote, I'm not going to vote when this was prior to the election, or I've never voted, or I'm feeling, you know, I'm feeling like my vote doesn't matter. And it's, it's really about looking back into that history and why it's so important. I think, you know, it's, it's also important, you know, I kind of have an attitude about it, but <laughs> it's also important to acknowledge those feelings, right? A lot of people feel disenfranchised. They feel attacked. They are, I mean, there's a lot of ways where, you know, you can understand why folks are saying, okay, I voted, but now what? What is that going to do? Trump's still president. Um, and so I think, you know, acknowledging those conversations, acknowledging those feelings, and, you know, being able to kind of teach them about, it's not just about one election, it's about all the elections. It's about your local elections. And um, I think that's a, a huge thing, especially with young voters, as they look at it as just, okay, the president election, presidential election, but interim elections, there's all, there's, there's a fall off. There's no education, there's no information. Um, and so I think that's a good way too of educating folks around interim and your local elections and how policies and things are made in your communities, because it's not just about the president, it's from the ground up. Um, and that's a big lack of education with uh, young voters today of just thinking one vote is going to change your life and not being active um, just, uh, you know, across the board. So first question is, you know, might look at you sideways, but, but at that, after that moment, I'm going to start to educate you about why we're here, why it's so important, um, and then also give you ways to continue that um, you know, that engagement in your, in your community where you feel like it touches you more passionately, more deeply, and in an everyday basis versus just the, you know, the national narrative. Thank you. So, so I wanna jump in on this as well. Um, so I appreciate your honesty, because I'll probably look at you sideways as well. <laughs> um, I'm not a millennial. Um, I, I think I'm part of this Generation Xer crowd. I, I've lost track of where the numbers lie. Um, you know, am I with you? Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah. So we're here. We're thank you. I appreciate it. I, I feel kind of old sometimes up here. Two babies and stuff. But so I think I, I want to really highlight this issue of understanding our electoral process and our democratic process. The fact I, I really appreciate. Uh, Reverend Anthony's uh, mentioning of the fact that we're not talking about teaching our children about civic engagement in the schools right now. Um, I'm getting back to you know, what I said earlier, that this is really a comprehensive conversation that we need to have, and people need to understand how all of these 
pieces fit together. So when people tell me or someone, you know, again, once I get past my attitude and continue to talk to you, I think that you, we do, I have to take a step back and say, all right, maybe you just don't understand. I think that is a lot of it. And because they're not taught necessarily and maybe have not been taught, and maybe even if they think they've been taught, I'm not confident that people fully get how our process works here. You may not like it, but that doesn't mean it doesn't exist, all right? There are so much that happens in this society that I don't like, but I can't ignore it. Yeah. Ignorance is not bliss when you're actually educated about it. I'm sorry, look. There is times after you've found out how things work, you do not have a right to tell me that it doesn't matter, all right? So I think we do have to educate. I think that people need to understand that, yes, this is a democratic process, it's not fully democratic. There are forces that are always contributing to the suppression of the right to vote by all people. I don't think that everybody fully appreciates that this has been going on for years, not just since the civil rights movement. <laughs> this has been going on. The suppression of our right to vote has evolved in so many different contexts. The fact that we have heard the conversation about 91 votes or 91 bills being introduced since 2000 in the beginning of, of this year, that happened in 2006. That's when the voter ID bill started, y'all. Yeah. It happened in 2000. That's when all the redistricting really started mm -hmm. happening and taking mm -hmm. place. It happened again in 2010 when people went to vote for Barack in 2008 and then forgot to come out or didn't care enough to come out. And the fact of the matter is that that is actually what changed so much of this country. That 2010 election, when all the state legislatures <laughs> changed, they flipped. What do you think happened? They went and redistricted, okay? So now you have all these people in office who you can't get the hell out. Mm -hmm. Excuse me, I'm, I shouldn't be saying that. There are children here. You're but forgiven my, by the I'm minister. forgiven, thank you. The two, two and the, the, the preacher's daughter. And so, but my point is this. It, it, is a, it continues to happen. And I think people need to understand that this didn't just come out of sight. Mm -hmm. All right, that this, this has been happening for years. So we need to educate panels like this. You all need to tweet this. You all need to Facebook. In, Instagram with the WhatsApp, Instagram. 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 Hold y'all, I'm Generation X, y'all. Right? Um, so, but this needs to get out. So I, I really want to highlight the education factor and respect the fact that, okay, maybe you just don't know and you don't fully get how the school board vote matters and how your city council vote matters, and that you can't just come out on the presidential election, because you're right. Maybe you didn't feel like there was any change when you elected the president, Barack Obama, our forever president. But you know why? Because you didn't get out and vote again. And you didn't help him, all right? You didn't help elect those that needed to be in office to help him move the agenda that we all wanted to see. So that's our fault, y'all. And those of you all who didn't vote, look in the mirror, as Michael Jackson always says, and understand how it is you affected this process and why it is you feel disenfranchised. You need to look at yourself and understand how you contributed to that. So that's my past the attitude and trying to deal with the education factor. Um, and I, I really think that that's important for us to understand. Thank you, that was great. Forever 44. I have a question for the lawyers on the panel. So given the recent makeup of a lot of the states, I'm from a very important state, Ohio, um, gerrymandered to shreds in some of the districts, um, the way that they've drawn them. How do you see our federal courts and our state courts impacting gerrymandering and in the way Simone said, we will sue you in litigation moving forward? So. How do our courts see it? If we get to the courts, it's too late. That's the reality, it's too late. I'm gonna go to your last question, I'm gonna to come to this question. It's not the responsibility or the blame of young people if they don't engage, they engage differently than how we think they should. It's the responsibilities of organizations like the NAACP at the Black Church who have failed them. We have failed them because we have not trained, taught, and continued the legacy of understanding that the price for freedom is engagement of all of our community in the civic process. 
if civic is not taught in school, where would they get it? They have to get it from us. Yeah. And the reason why I'm sitting here is because there's a group of elders that taught me, whether they was NACP or SNCC or somewhere in between, that's where I got the most education around what it means to be free and how to seek power and control power. And so we got to stop playing the game of us against them when we're responsible. I have a 22-year-old, an 18-year-old, and a 16-year-old, and when they friends get to the house, I realize I see the deficit when I start engaging them in conversations around their responsibility. So it's incumbent upon me and Reverend Anthony and NACP to create a framework so we can invite young people in to be, be empowered. It's incumbent upon black elected officials, over a thousand African American elected officials in this country, and they're selfish, majority of them. Why? Because they campaign for their reelection, then they sit down on the local reelection elections. It's one of the biggest vote suppress suppressors in the country. If you look at the turnout of a district of an elected official when they're on the ballot being contested, it goes up. You look at that same uh, set of precincts. Non-presidential cycle, when they're not on the ballot or not contested, it goes down. That tells you something about their engagement with their constituency base. They campaign to get back in office, then they sit down when we got to keep people engaged. Mm -hmm. If we get to the courts when we're dealing with redistricting, it's too late. 2018 is the key for us talking about redistricting. We have a five-year cycle of either being even more disempowered or getting empowered. Midterm elections, the census process, the census process, this administration have defunded funding of the census. So our institutions where we exist need to be engaged with to make sure there's not an undercount in Detroit. In the 90s when they did an undercount, they got together and they made sure they corrected the count. We have to be prepared for that 2020 presidential, but then redistricting, then midterms all over again. Those are the next five years of our political reality that is gonna define the nature of who we are. 35 states under Republican governorships, three more states, we're talking about Constitutional Convention. Constitutional Convention means they're talking about redefining the meaning of citizenship, 14th Amendment. We're sitting here because of the 14th and 13th and 15th Amendment. Mm -hmm. So it's our responsibility to train our young people, but we have to understand, if we get to the course, it's too late, next year's midterm election is where we have to be even more engaged than we've ever been. So Donald Trump um, has the ability to, for the first time, confirm over 150 judges, whoever he likes, for lifetime appointments. Not only has he so told senators that he is going, he's not going to consult with them, but he's put forth candidates who've said things like the children of LGBTQI individuals are Satan's spawn. He's put forth judges who've said that this president was not an American and was from Kenya. And as I represent for black immigrants, I'm like, that's a good thing. But our president was not born in Kenya. He was born here. He has put forth judges who have disrespect, demean, and thought about our people as less than. And yet he is moving forward with placing these judges in place and no one knows or has said anything about it. Because we, I recognize, we have so much on our plate. We are trying to go to work, we're trying to take care of our kids, but if you care about the environment, if you care about voting rights, if you care about reproductive freedom and access, if you care about immigration, if you care about our future, you have to care about judges. And I tell you, we, what did I start the conversation? We give away our power. Last year, nine black women were elected to state judgeships in Alabama nine black women, and no one saw them coming. Why? Because they organized the sororities and the fraternal groups, and they organized in their churches, and they went to the barbershop and the nail salon, and you know we stay fly coming for CBC. And they went there, 
and said, you know what? I need you guys to register and vote for me. Because what people don't understand that 90% of cases that are handled in this country don't go to the Supreme Court that we hear about. They don't go to the federal court. They go to state courts. When we're talking about our criminal justice system, state courts. We're out here in these streets dying, but we're not running to be judges and change the game. If we want to see something different, we have to do different things. If we want our democracy to look like us and represent us, then we have to put ourselves out there. We have to run to be judges. We can't just be lawyers now. That was the first step. Thank you, um, Thurgood. Thank you, Constance. But the next step is how can we sit on the benches? How can we change our communities? How can we change the conversation? Barack Obama put forth the most diverse group of judges ever in history. But Donald Trump, in one year, will overturn that. In one year. And unless we get out there and say something and say to these senators that the judges you're putting forth of is unacceptable, then it will be as if Barack Obama was never here. And so my question that everybody on this panel has posed to you is what role do you play in changing our democracy? This is not a sideline game. We are fighting for the soul of our country and we all have a role to play. So two things on that. I think one of the things is interesting having this conversation is that a lot of people I think also I think it's your viewpoint. I actually see the election of Donald Trump and all the folks he's putting in power actually as a victory. Um, I see it as a victory meaning that. Oh, Red. No, no, no. I, I don't know. Explain that. Yeah, no. I see it as a victory because if you understand one going back to 2010. Citizens United. Corporations were trying to do all they could to impact elections. I believe that when President Barack Obama was elected and when young people were taken to the streets in Ferguson and in Baltimore and all over this country, that these folks decided to say, listen, we are going to cut out the middleman. We are no longer going to be hiring somebody, so I need Tillerson, you got to leave Exxon. Pruitt, you got to take over at EPA. Mm -hmm. Donald Trump, you got to leave whatever you've been leaving your apprentice and come on to be the president. But that means that they're on their last leg. That means that if they, that mean, in other words, when generals are fighting and no longer soldiers, that means that they at the end of their road. Mm -hmm. They're fighting for their monuments. We're beating them. They're killing us in Charlottesville. They're killing us in Ferguson. But for the first time, they're feeling the pressure. Even policemen now are chanting, whose streets? Because it really is our streets. And so something is happening in the land because you, I'm just trying to give you a different way of looking at this. They are frantic. So, that, so what you're seeing from them is that they're throwing everything at us. In other words, if they lose this, this battle, they know there will be more people of color in this country. They know if they lose this battle, millennials will be voting at the highest rates. They'd be the, they'd be the, millennials will be the biggest voting block in the next year's election. They know that for the old white man rule, this is their last stand. And so I'm telling you that because we, if you know what you're coming up against and you see it that way, then we will approach it a little differently, not just them us winning, but maybe them losing and holding on to their last grasp of white supremacy. This is it. So if we can come together as a people, really organize and empower our institutions, that's the most important part. What here leads is this. The only way you can beat institutional racism is with strong institutions. Individuals can't beat institutions. And so what I'm saying to us right now, because this, this is the gold line stance. This is it. We're at that moment. And it's not just about equality, it's about existence. 
And so they have put all on the line. They are willing to take us all down the ship. Now, I'm very clear. I'm clear. Their policies, their framework means extinction for us. I'm clear it means genocide for us. I'm clear what their game plan. It literally means death for their own children. They are at that moment. And when you have somebody so radical on that side, that means that we have to be radical on our side as well. We got to meet this the, the firm way. So what I'm saying to us in this question about the millennial component, I need y'all for this one second for me, because I'm in both the suites and the streets. And I know we have this conversation here in the convention center, in the air conditioned halls, and in some cushy seats. I need for you, though, that question that was asked a little while ago in regards to why some folks don't want to be engaged. For a quick second, remove the walls. Take away these walls. Make yourself outside. Now, transform yourself from Northwest to Southeast DC. Like, I need you to do that. And if you don't know what Southeast is, that's, that's the, that's, that's, that's part of the problem. But if you don't know what Southeast DC and you're visiting, from this process, it's, the other, it's on the other side of the railroad tracks. It's, those, it's that spot in our community where, you know, everybody leaves at 6 p.m., mm -hmm. but folks still live there. Mm -hmm. So I need you to go there for a second. I need you to see there's still police tape up on the walls. I need you to see that the mothers are looking, that it's a, it's, it's a hard community. Now have this conversation. Let's now put these children in the middle of that neighborhood and let them be walking around looking at us like, what, what are they doing here? And that's the first problem. We are not in our streets, we're only in the suites. We don't have our Fannie Lou Hamers of our movement because we are looking for, we're only looking for genius inside the academy, not for genius outside the academy. I know it's good to go to college. I know it's good, I got a bunch of degrees myself, but we need to then find those folks who can say I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. That's the only way that we're gonna fight this at this moment that I'm talking about. I'm telling y'all, this life and death moment that I'm talking about, we are going to need to get our Fan Lou Hamers, so they can fight and they can be empowered, which goes back to the vote. Because if they can't vote, if they can't be in the system, if they don't have a voice, then our numbers shrink. This is our lunch counter moment for the 21st century. Let's not come to another CBC. I get it's party time. I, I'm not against that. But I'm just saying, let us not come at this moment, eight months after the election of this president, with a monument on the mall and miss the moment that our elders have fought for. Let us not miss this moment. We must do all we can do. Thank you. That was good. As your woke moderator in chief and former <laughs> Southeast resident, I am absolutely fired up by all of the amazing words of encouragement and advice and insight that these experts um, have shared with us today. I would like to take a moment to recognize, speaking of millennials, I don't know if they still count as millennials, but the young men in the back from Brown High School. Right. Beginning stages of seeping in and pouring in that knowledge about the importance of voting. And we hope that moving forward that this conversation inspires you all to vote, to get engaged, to run for office, and to raise awareness about this important matter um, amongst your friends. Thank you. And now I would like to open it up to the floor for questions. So if you have questions for the panelists, this is your time. Ariana will be around with the mic. We have some over here. Good late morning, everyone. My name is Izmira H. I am from Milwaukee, Wisconsin, a certain zip code 53206, which incarcerates more black men than most plots on the planet and exports them, exports as in human capital, to outskirts of the USA rural communities that count them as constituents. So my question, oh, I must also mention that I lived abroad for many years. Uh, I work for a member of Congress now uh, who sits on the Helsinki Commission and also the House Democracy Partnership that goes around to fledgling democracies throughout the world to 
have peer-to-peer -peer interparliamentary exchanges, how to better democratize our societies. My question is for the Honorable Dr. Killian from Poland. Um, your regional neighbor, Ukraine, and I think this is also true in Poland, I know it's definitely true in the European countries I've lived, they consider incarcerated people uh, an electorate in that there are poles in the prisons. Right. And those numbers are counted from where they were taken, their, their home zip codes, not where they were you know, put in prison. So can you speak to that a little bit more, just to give us black Americans an idea of how incarcerated people in your country of Poland, um, throughout Western Europe, are dealt with as participants in democracy, unlike what our very undemocratic process is here, to completely disenfranchise them because they, they look like us. Right. Can you speak to that a little bit, please? Do you understand my question? <laughs> Make it much, much clearer than it is because... Sure, sure, sure. How are prisoners treated in Poland? Are they allowed to vote while they are serving their sentence? Right. Does it, can I answer? Or it just... All right, okay, thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, just, just to get back to our, our previous discussion over the, the involvement of the, the young people in the voting and uh, in the participation in the elections and so forth, I do believe that uh, there is need actually to engage young people in uh, being candidates as well because that motiv motivates the youth actually to be able to take part in the voting as well. Yeah. The most of the experience of the European countries, some of the European countries today, is that uh, at least 25% of the candidates, because of course we have got another electoral system like in Poland, we have got a list of candidates. If I told there are nine seats, for example, in any constituency, there are supposed to be 20, no, there are supposed to be 18 candidates from the particular party. So that party tries by all means to have at least 25% of the youth in it in order to encourage the young people and the youth to be able to vote. Coming back to the question that you've just posed, uh, we find that all, prison, all prisons in Poland, for example, they are equipped with electoral boxes where every prisoner is entitled to vote, despite the fact that he's been there for, 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 for life or for whatever, he, everybody is in tri entitled to vote. So <clears throat> it is something that is natural. I don't know how it is in the US, but uh, in as far as Poland is concerned, prisoners. Yes, I got a friend of mine actually who won a, a district, uh, as a district councillor, mainly from the votes of, of the, the prisoners, mm -hmm. because she promised that she's going to do the, the legal help on most of them. So most of them actually voted for that individual. So it, it's actually a compulsory issue that every prison has got a pallet box and they're in a position to vote. Thank you, I hope I've answered the question. Wow. Can, Desiree, can I, just, can I jump can in? Can I just comment on that sure. also? I, I think that the uh, returning citizens and those already incarcerated uh, is a community that we certainly need to prioritize. Uh, we in Detroit have spent time in prisons registering people to vote. A number of um, inmates do not know that they can still vote if they've not been sentenced, they've not felonies and all of that. So we have taken uh, registration forms inside prisons and I encourage everybody, don't be scared, just go on in. Uh, the brothers and sisters will love the fact that you've taken the time to come in and to register them and they can get absentee ballots uh, and then they, they can vote. Um, and uh, it's important also, we have, we have a program in Michigan now because all of this stuff is connected. Um, uh, it's called, see if they, if they come out and they can vote, they don't have a job. They ain't gonna vote no more. If they come out and have a job, they may continue to, to vote. And so one of the programs we've, uh, that has been launched and we're trying to expand is called Trading Places. It's a program that was started by the governor and some of the union people. The governor need to do 
something because he done done some other stuff uh, that has been so bad. So this is one thing that was good. And when somebody does something good, you got to acknowledge that. So maybe they do something else that's good. But it's called trading places so that inmates who are nonviolent um, um, inmates can learn skilled trades while they're in prison. And when they come out, they are almost through the unions, they're able to get certain kinds of cards and they have access to jobs. Uh, so we're saying that that needs to be a model. It's called trading places. Trade your place. Uh, and you get uh, a registration, voter registration card as well. So we're not as, our nation is not as progressive as Poland, um, as most other countries when it comes to health care and things of that nature. Uh, but that is a community that must be served and that we need to address because they're coming back. Uh, and they can still have access to the polls even while uh, they may be incarcerated. Right. Thanks. Nicole? That's right. Hi. Um, you yeah. all going to have to excuse me. I have to stand up. Number one, I can't see this part of the room. Let me borrow this one, right? <laughs> I can't see that part of the room. And, I, and this is also important, and I can't sit. Um, holding on to our themes about church, I can't hold my peace, so I'm going to stand up. Mm. Um, <laughs> And also, this panel is so awesome and dynamic and large, I may never get to talk again, so I'm gonna make my couple quick points. Number one, folks need to understand this. There is an interconnectedness to these issues that we are talking That's about. Right. Mm -hmm. I know this panel is about voting. This is not just about voting. That's right. This is about empowering people in our democracy, the That's democracy right. that was promised to us all in the Constitution, even though we weren't thought of initially, only parts of us, but that is our Constitution. And we have to remember that we have to think about all of these issues right. in connectivity. Don't think about it in silos. This is voting, this is education, this is immigration, this is housing. No, it is all one big issue. Right. And we have to change our mindset about how we think about this. And also understand the question about voting and the formerly incarcerated, and we have to change our messaging too. These are not former felons, they are the formerly incarcerated because they are just like you, me, and your cousin Sheree Ray, and so we have to speak ab about them with respect. So let's change our language. But understand that this whole issue, the reason why it's different in Poland and in other parts of Europe and in other parts of the world is because felon issues, as they called them, were meant to keep black and brown folks lower than everyone else and not having the same rights. Right. That's why that issue is different in this country. We also have to understand that we have to take a two-pronged approach to how we deal with it. You must understand that how those issues are dealt with around the country are state-by-state state issues. Mm -hmm. It's not just a national issue. Voting rules are made by individual states. So let's talk about what you all have to do. We've all been saying this is up to you. Number one, go back to your states, look at what the rules and regulations are dealing with the formerly incarcerated, and determine how you can get involved in changing them, mostly by electing different people to your governor's offices mm -hmm. and to be your state assembly people, your state mm -hmm. senators, and your state representatives. Mm -hmm. And understand that on the federal level, leaders like Mr. Conyers have a bill called the Democracy Restoration Act, right. which would ensure that with respect to federal elections, individuals would have their right to vote restored right. immediately upon mm -hmm. their return mm -hmm. to the community. Mm -hmm. Secondly, understand that related to this issue is this issue of fees and fines. You heard about this in Ferguson, yeah. Yeah. where jurisdictions are using tickets and child support payments and all these other things to That's keep right. people in the criminal justice system. Mm -hmm. So not only do you have to look at restoring the right to vote, you have to look at how do we get rid of these fees and fines. And when you see those issues come up, and the US Commission on Civil Rights just came out with a report right. yesterday, That's because right. I testified at one of their hearings, you have to look at what can you do in your community mm -hmm. to ensure that these fees and fines are not keeping people in the criminal justice system. And lastly, I'm going to say this that you have to remember that the power to change things 
is on the local level. That's right. You've heard that. I just can't underscore that right. enough. Mm -hmm. Do not just look to your members of Congress. They That's are right. here and they have a job to do, but go back to your communities. Mm -hmm. After that Sunday bake sale in church, after the meeting about Women's Day and the fashion show that we're going to hold, mm -hmm. talk about what we're going to do in our communities to put more people in power who are going to put in place the kinds of reforms and the agenda that you want to be put in place. Mm -hmm. So remember the interconnectivity of this, that the power is yours, and that you have to look at what you need to do on the local level. And if I don't get to talk again, Desiree, I'm fine. I've given the marching orders, and I know that you all are going to go back Amen. to your communities and follow. Pass the plate. We're going to take one more question from the audience. My name is Asa Gordon. I'm the recipient of the 2016 Civil Rights and Justice Award for advocating the voting right legacy of those of African descent who served in the Civil War. Yeah. Title II, United States, Section 6 of United States Code, is called the Reduction of Representation Code. It was the statute that was enforced the first census following the Civil War in 1872. It called for the reduction of those states in proportion to the former slaves who would be disfranchised from the right to vote. That provision of the Constitution is still in effect and has never been enforced. You are looking at the only individual to try to enforce this provision of the Constitution in Gordon versus National Archives over the 2016 election. What I am advocating that, I want you to research, research the second session of the 14th Amendment that reduces the representation of states in Congress in proportion to the voters of their states whose votes have been abridged or denied. It's never been enforced. The reason why lawyers do not want to deal with this, what lawyer wants to be arguing before court in his state that, Your Honor, there are a number of representatives in this state that are in Congress that have to go home because of the disfranchisement or the abridgment of the right of votes of the citizens who votes in this state. That's why a lot of this have to be done pro se by lawyers, by those who vote. Lawyers don't want to touch this. I'm going to be honest about this. Now, the 26, 20 uh, census, which is coming up, there needs to be pressure on our lawyers to bring suit to ensure that the 20 census is in conformance with the statute of the 1872 census, which in, in fact demands proportional apportionment of our representatives in Congress according to party, race, or whatever, those who exercise the right to vote. Thank you. So section two, the so 14th much. Amendment, www.electors.us. Thank you. I would like to send the mic to one of the students from Brown High School to allow them to ask a question before we come back to the panelists. Thank you. Hi. Um, my name is Christian Johnson. I'm a 10th grader at Ron Brown College Preparatory High School. Um, my question is, like, we talk about, um, like, I don't know how to put this. I'm nervous. Um, it's okay. We talk about the criminal justice system in school, us five, all the time, but our peers don't listen. So how do we get them to be engaged in the conversation? Great question. Um, I think we have to make it real for people. And so a lot of times when you talk about um, activism or people getting engaged, first of all, people will tell you actually that they don't even like politics. So a lot of times y'all are talking about the, the very pressing issues and you got people that will tell you, I don't like all that politics stuff. And um, I think what people are really saying is they don't like to be partisan, but they don't understand that politics governs every single part of our lives. If you'd like to go to the grocery store and get lettuce that's not brown, that's politics. Um, if you want to be able to play basketball in your neighborhood, that's politics. So I think it's really about making the issues real for our various communities, but understand that everybody's not going to be with you. Um, I was on a panel yesterday, Reverend Yearwood and some folks from the faith community talking about the environment. Congressman Conyers sponsored that as well. And something Reverend Carroll said, I want to make sure I say here, because I think it'll help you because it helped me. He said, you know, we talk about the civil rights movement as though we were all there mm. and that everybody <laughs> was with us. 
and we was all engaged and everybody was 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 marching and everyone was civically engaged and the reality of it is that we weren't all everybody's church wasn't mobilizing all you know your favorite pastor's pastor wasn't at the meeting talking about come let's go we're gonna take the people we all were not there you know every everybody in the community wasn't ready to go marching some people still got on the bus <laughs> okay so if we understand that the reality is everybody wasn't quote unquote about that life as they like to as we like to talk about it now I think that's how we have to approach it in our communities. And so I feel, I feel you. Criminal justice reform is important. The economy is important. All these issues young people were dealing with every single day. But the reality of it is sometimes we got to go and then just slowly bring our folks along with us. So y'all continue to engage with your peers um, in the classroom and outside of the classroom. You continue to talk about the issues continue to make it real for them. But I really believe that by you all standing up, doing what you're doing, um, being out here, you are an example for other folks that might not get it right now, but they're going to get it later. That was a great question. So I, I want to just mention something. I, I appreciate gentlemen's earlier, you know, I know it's commentary, but I, I just want to get to the point about lawyers again and how we can affect the system in a variety, in different ways. It's not always about being in a courtroom, but it's also about being leaders in your community. Um, and that's for anybody. And I want to emphasize, I know I introduced earlier the our president of the National Bar Association. The National Bar Association was established because the American Bar Association would not allow black lawyers and judges to be a part of the association. Um, we recently hosted our conference in Toronto, Canada. Now, you're asking me, why did y'all go to Canada to host a conference of the National Bar Association? Well, organizations like the NAACP and others were actually originated in Canada because we weren't allowed to originally form here in the U.S. So there are things that people don't know the history of, but I was asked the question about, well, what is the MBA? And I had to explain to a Canadian, well, you know, this is why we exist. He, he didn't understand why the MBA exists in the ABA. But getting back to just this issue of how attorneys can affect other changes, not only to be leaders, but also to help support others in the community who are trying to affect change. So our candidates, trying to help other people run. Recently, our president has reestablished a PAC for the MBA. I know we're not political partisan here. However, the point is you do have to be engaged in some way. And so you've got to understand how the system works and that's what the MBA is trying to do right now. And then lastly, I just want to say in terms of other work that needs to be done, we talked about the, the lack of voter integrity commission that exists right now. Did y'all get that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. the, the, I guess as Reverend Jesse Jackson says, the KKK led uh, Voter Integrity Commission, what is it, Kobach, Chris Kobach from Kansas. <laughs> so um, there is an interest in creating a voter suppression commission that actually highlights what actually is going on, not a voter integrity. The fact that we're going to combat what it is you're saying. We're going to tell you the truth about what actually is going on. So there are ways in which we can make sure we affect the narrative and don't allow others to create the narrative for us. Because it is our country. We're all immigrants except for Native Americans. We all, and some of us, were not brought here by our own regard. So we all need to be able to create the narrative of what this country is. And I think we've got to find ways in which we can do that to educate ourselves. And I think lawyers, attorneys, judges, law students, those who want to be lawyers, you know, we can all do that in our community, and I just want to emphasize that the MBA would be there in order to help support those efforts. Thank you. I'd like to send it back to the audience for one final question, and then we'll move to final remarks and last statements from the panelists. Uh, I'm Mildred Hodgson, and I'm the president of the Central Long Island NAACP, and I've been doing voters registration for over 30 years. This last 2016, I did not have a very good result. Many people did not uh, want to register. However, 
I registered a lot of ex-felons and those who were not on probation or um, parole. And they were very enthused about registering because, <coughs> and not only that, but I went around to the barber shops and the hairdressers and I put up the sign in the window. They let me put up the sign to say that the ex-felons could vote because many of them did not know that. And this was something that I've been pushing and I've been doing that and I've been going, um, <coughs> excuse me, I've been even going door to door in my area and uh, not just with the regular voting because many people do not, they only vote in the presidential elections and I've been telling them to vote in the local elections which affect them. And um, I've been trying to get them to do that because right now we have one person that's running for legislator. We're trying to get another person to run for Congress. He ran for Congress last year against Peter King who's a buddy with uh, Donald Trump. And uh, anyway, um, and this one, he said he's not sure if he's going to run this year, but I've been trying to encourage him and all the other people because there are a lot of young people out there that I feel that they should try to run for some of these local um, elections. But so many of them, I don't know why they don't want to do it. Plus, I have a problem, believe it or not, with our clergy more than anybody else. They do not support the way they should. I call them up. I know all of them out there because I've been out there uh, for over 40 years. And I know most of them, but I don't get the support from the clergy that I should get. And uh, I'd like to know what do I do to get them to really try to help us the way they should because they don't come out and address the community the way they should. And I told them everybody's not going to show up on Sunday morning to your church. So Thank you. So you have to come to the community. Before, so before you like answer that question, let's clap for her for doing voter registration drive. <laughs> Thank you. 30 years worth of voter registration drives. We need more of that, and we, we truly appreciate and value your efforts. And I will um, allow one of the reverends or the PK answer the question. <laughs> I, I don't know why you was looking at me when you were saying that about, about clergy, but let me just say this. <laughs> but let me say this. Um, clergy are like lawyers, are like doctors, are like entertainers, are like athletes, are like politicians. You got some who are engaged and some who are not engaged. Starts with your pastor. Uh, you seem to have some fire. Uh, and so it starts with your pastor. But let me say this. The church has a duty and a responsibility and obligation. Were it not for the church, we would not be sitting here today. Let's not forget how we got over. And the black church for tradition and for historical um, generations has been and it's the only one that we had. So let's not diss it to that degree. It is not perfect, uh, but it is still the only institution that we really control. It is the black church. With all its faux pas, with all its problems, it is still that institution. I wish that there were a lot of pastors who spoke more about civic engagement and liberation theology right. uh, than what we have right now. So many are concerned about pie in the sky when you die. So many are concerned about profit over prophecy. So many are concerned about, um, you know, just getting over and making life easy. We, we, so it shouldn't not be very difficult for any church to open up its doors in a mass uh, flood uh, without waiting to see what the city is going to do and then open up my church to see if in fact uh, then we can take folk in uh, and folks still support that uh, what would Jesus do the reality is this and when the, when the young brother uh, asked the question and posed the issue of young people getting them to go sometimes you need to take young people to prison and let them see what the reality is. Let them talk to folk who've been engaged. Let them get engaged and put their hands on it. I, I think one of the realities is, and this is good, to the degree that, you know, if you don't like the church, join the NACP. Mm -hmm. If you don't like the NACP, join the Urban League. Like if you don't like the Urban League, join your fraternity. Mm -hmm. If you don't like your fraternity, join your block club. If you don't like your block club, join uh, some other organization, nonprofit that's doing so. If you don't like that organization, 
Start your own organization. <laughs> but if you ain't willing to join nothing and to start your own, you need to shut your mouth and sit down because you really ain't serious. Right. I often say, I say to everybody, that there is enough hell burning around in America for everybody to get their own individual bucket and decide what fire you want to put out. Now, if you ain't willing to get a bucket and put on no fire, you need to shut up and sit down. We fight until we win. The elephant is big. We cannot afford to just fight on one issue. I don't have time to be mad at him because he ain't doing it the way I want to do it or her because she ain't doing it the way I want to do it. I need to get on my own program, ride my own horse, and make a difference in my own community. If you ain't about that, then you ain't about seriously trying to help us on the road to freedom. Get on the freedom trail, no matter which trail it is, and do something to lift up our people. Thank you. Okay, we are almost out of time. I'm going to set the scene because we're going to give uh, final statements. Church started at 10 o'clock. Colin Kaepernick is still playing in the NFL, and the football game started at 2. It's 1.55. <laughs> Let's start with the code. She means be brief. Right. 30 yeah, seconds. I got it. You got it. Final statements. All right. 30 seconds. Well, well, unfortunately, he ain't playing. Uh, <laughs> that is right. That is and I ain't watching. <laughs> and I hope you ain't either. I'm taking half a rep's minute. Okay. <laughs> um, quickly, we talked a lot about overarching themes. One thing I just want to leave you all with, you have to be armed with information. It's not enough to hear us offer these wonderful statements and to clap and to throw your shoe. It's not enough to do that. You have to have information. So I want to let you know about information. If you go to the Brennan Center's website, brennancenter.org, there are all kinds of tools for you about everything that we've talked about today, about the voting issues, about foreign interference in our elections, about fees and fines, about the formerly incarcerated. And I have some material outside for you, the case for automatic voter registration. This is a major reform that will change how we register voters and will help us get five million more voters on the polls, on the, on the books to mm -hmm. participate in elections. Mm -hmm. That's how we create power. And then I also brought a book for you of collected essays. It's about all the different issues that we work on at the, at the Brennan Center, again, to help strengthen our democracy and justice system and to fix what's broken. Mm -hmm. So remember, it's not enough to feel good, hoot and holler and clap. You have to be armed with knowledge and information. Mm -hmm. Go to our website, get that knowledge and get that information. Thank you. <laughs> I gotta stand up. <laughs> Um, I would just leave it with, I think if we look around the room, we all look fairly alike as far as how educated, how informed we are, and even some of the industries and things that we work in. Um, what I would like for folks to do, if you want to talk to people or you want to understand how people are engaging beyond the ballot box, find the folks that are. There are many people in the technology space, the Silicon Valleys of the world, the data and analyst folks that aren't in politics, aren't in community activism, but they have the tools and technology and millions of dollars worth of resources and they just don't know how to engage with us. They want to, they have the passion, but no one's knocking on their door to actually engage them and give them the strategic information that we all have at this table and some of you in, in, in the crowd, but they just need to be engaged and shown how to use those resources. And technology is such a great way and an effective way to, all, to get people involved, keep them involved. And so I just kind of challenge everyone. There are folks out there, the blavities of the world, the you know, people that you don't think actually are a part of this movement. I mean, folks from, you know, obviously Reverend Yearwood is talking about a lot of our celebrity influencers, but these folks have money and they have a voice beyond their lyrics. And so we need to be able to reach out to these people and give them the opportunity to help us get our folks out and voting and a part of this movement. Thank you. How many of you all like what we're experiencing with this administration right now? I, I was hoping I didn't see any hands. So if you don't, then I need you to remember that feeling Remember what happened the day after the election. Remember how you felt. And I need you to take that with you every moment up until the next election. Not the next federal election, but the next election. 
and then I need you to talk to your brother, and to your sister, to your mother, your father, your niece, your nephew, your family members, your friends, and say, I need you to go vote with me. Or I need you to call your friends in other states that are having elections, like in Virginia, across the way. We have an election that's happening this year. We have a gentleman who was running to potentially be the first African American um, lieutenant. A, a lieutenant governor. I need you to call your friends in New Jersey. I need you to call your friends who have off your elections. I need you to remember that feeling every moment until the next election. We have selective amnesia and selective memory in this country. We forget how we felt and we forget what happened. And I think we need to remember that as we keep moving every day. And I encourage you all to have the conversations you may not want to have. Talk to your friends who maybe didn't engage and ask them why. And have that conversation and understand and try to educate them and figure out how you can help them realize how they can actually affect change in the very minimal way. Because we all have a role to play. We all are important in this society. And believe me, that one vote does matter. <clears throat> So I'm going to leave you with uh, <clears throat> two quick things. One, I will say, think about new coalitions. As I look around the room, I see a lot of my Hispanic brothers and sisters. And as a black immigrant, I often think about if the immigrant community and the Black Lives Matter and the economic justice communities got together and we all rose up and we went to the White House and we organized and we voted together, there is absolutely nothing that could stop us. But they know that we silo and separate ourselves and we say our issues are this and immigration is just for my Latino brothers and sisters and, uh, and justice rights are just for black people and the environment is just for white folk. And so we don't come together. And that's how they're winning. And so I will say to us that we should think about how do we work together across coalition and find our collective power. So that's one. And the last thing I will lead you with is love because this is hard work, it is tiring, and I know people are hurting. We are hurting because we see each other and we see the pain that we're all experiencing, and the only way we're gonna get this and get past this moment is together. And so I recommend, I have my sister circle and my extended family here. I bring my children and my babies and I look at them every day, and I say find the place that you need for your love to carry you through the next few years, because that's what we're gonna need in order to move forward. Otherwise, we will find ourselves broke down, busted, disgusted, and not knowing what to do. And you know what? When we are like that, that's how they will win. So find that moment. Find your love. Find your support system. Find your networks. And keep on keeping on. Thanks. The only thing that matters is what we can measure. Making statements, having protests don't, don't matter if we can't measure an electoral outcome. Selma was a failure. I say this every time I get in trouble. Two marches across the bridge, we've celebrated for over 52 years now, absolutely, absolute failure. Because the lives of the folks who lived in Selma didn't mater materially change as a result of those marches. Smitherman was the mayor in 1965 in a 70% city and he remained mayor until 2000. Ferguson was a failure. It democratized media. It allowed young people to get engaged. We were able to get firsthand account what was taking place in a city that was 67% black. And after an election, the same folks who created conditions for the marshals are still in power. The only thing that matter is what we can measure. Protest is important, is necessary many times, but it's not sufficient. 
And we have to build infrastructure to deal with a democracy so we can leverage our currency, which is our vote. But we have to set goals and benchmarks and measure to determine if it's success, evaluate what didn't work so we can change it, and learn from what did work so we can begin to expand it and understand that it, do, it does not happen just in media markets. It happens all across the landscape, and especially in rural communities where we can have the most impact. Thank you. So two things, I guess is actually I want to do kind of the pass the plate part of this process. Um, <clears throat> if we actually have a song that was released today, my hat, it's uh, actually called Here Comes the Sun. Um, it was sung by Antonique Smith, I mean, you know her, she played Faith Evans on Notorious, and also Jeremiah, um, wonderful R&B singer from Chicago. They put together a song called Here Comes the Sun. and. And if you go to People's Climate Music, this is very important right now, peoplesclimatemusic.com, and please make sure and pay, I guess, $1.49 on, on, on iTunes or on Tidal, or on Spotify. Get that song. The proceeds from that song will be going to folks for Harvey and, uh, and going to our folks and our organizations on the ground for Harvey and Irma and those who are still decimated and can't even in that aspect. So that's the, that's the first thing. So please, you know, please get here. It's a great song. Here comes the song, People's Climate Music .com. The one thing I do want to say, though, is this, is that I've been coming to CBC for many years, and we do need to figure out a way to take, go from the suites to the streets. We do got to figure out how to do love. And when I mean love, I, and I'm, I'm definitely with measuring and that aspect and how we can be more accountable and measurable. And I think that's very critical and important. But I have been, I've actually gone to too many funerals mm -hmm. and seen too many young activists who are committing suicide. Mm -hmm. and too many young folks in this movement who I know are fighting, but then they can't get a job. They, they come out here to the CBC, but we don't know if they got bus fare or they, or they paying rent or what's going on with their lives. We don't know nothing about it. We come and they go home and we don't, we're not really doing that solidarity. So I would implore all institutions to make sure that we need to, maybe it may take, I mean, I've already done it. I've already taken a pay cut in my job and hired a, another millennial to be the ED. And, and, we're, and we're, we're actually, the Hip Hop Caucus, paying folks rent in the movement. We're actually giving folks money in the movement. It may, it may, it may be a phone bill. Like, I know young folks who are here, just, man, Hip Hop Caucus, y'all paid our phone bill. Man, thank you. I just need to pay my phone bill so I can be connected. That means so much. So I think that we also, as a movement, look at what we can do to show love for those around us in our movement. In uh, my final comments, I think it is really important that if folks are wondering how can you get more young people involved, what can we do? I, I, we got to break down the silos, like Reverend Yearwood said. And, and so often, um, we are going and talking to our communities, and we're not talking with our communities. Because we got the answers. Because we educated, and we got all the degrees. Mm -hmm. And there's, there are so many young activists in places and spaces all across the country that are activating and organizing right now that could use additional resources, that could use additional bodies that we could collaborate with. So I don't want folks to think that um, the organizing is not happening in these communities. The organizing is absolutely happening. Some of y'all can't see it because we not in those places. All right. So, so the organizing is absolutely happening. Um, and the last point I think I want to make is that we have to, I believe, we should be talking about voting as a tool in the toolbox of justice. And there are other things that we absolutely have to do, but we also have to absolutely vote. And I think we, more communities, younger folks will be more receptive if that is the message that we take and that is the way in which we talk about voting in our community. So thank you so much. Thank you, Congressman Conyers, for having me on this panel today. You're absolutely amazing. We love you. We support you. Uh, and we're going to be here. <laughs> Having played the game alone for years, that's in Poland, I would like to emphasize that no matter the obstacles, be focused. Be focused. Don't give up. 
otherwise you lose. Learn to suit in your community. Watch. When, we, when you are in Rome, we say that do like the Romans, but be wise in what you are doing. Otherwise, you end up a failure. Learn to build coalitions, as it was indicated earlier. Find partners to be able to, to, to win. At the same time, we have to remember that when two elephants are fighting, it's not the elephants that suffer, it's the grass. That's right. So with that in mind, remember that wherever you are, as an elephant, think of the grass as well. Thank you so much. Very briefly, thank you, Congressman Conyers, once again for holding uh, this very important discussion. We appreciate you and your leadership over the years. And we don't know where we would be Absolutely. without you in Washington, D.C. That's right. I often That's right. say that I will take one John Conyers for every 10 of the other folk. <laughs> uh, and that's real. Let's give him another hand as we close out. Thank you, Congressman. And finally, let me just say this. Um, if we bring down the statues and leave up the policies, mm -hmm. we have not won. Come on. Mm -hmm. If we bring down the statues and leave up the policies, we have not won. It is about policy. Policies affect change. Policies must change. We can change policies. There's an old African proverb that says, when spider webs unite, they can tie up a lion. I'm looking at the spider webs. Let's go out and tie up the lion. Thank you very much. Let's all take a moment to stand for the congressman for allowing us to have this impactful yes. and deeply needed conversation at this time. We are so grateful for your leadership and for this opportunity. Thank you so much. And thank you all to the amazing panelists. And I have an announcement to make about the next panel shortly after, but I wanted to really thank you all for joining this conversation, allowing LCV to be a part of the conversation and host, but certainly your advice, your expertise, your sermons, um, your proverbs, <laughs> and your hashtags and your policy asks that will be moving forward from this. We, we will be forever grateful. Thank you so much. Following this panel is a panel on hate.